tried so hard to see it took me so long to believe it that you choose someone like me to carry your victory perfection could never earn it you give what we don't deserve and Take the broken things and raise them to glory. You are my champion, and giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you won, I am who you say. can finally see it. You're teaching me how to receive it. So let all the striving cease. Cause this is my victory. You are my champion. Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle
with breath. I had a word about people with problems with breathing, maybe asthma or allergies, and the Lord is wanting his love and his anointing to pour into you today. So if that speaks to you, please stand. Yep, if you have breathing issues, especially in the last couple weeks with allergies and stuff, yeah, this is for you, so take advantage of it. Okay, body, if you see people with, that are standing right now, just go to them and lay hands on them. And I'm going to speak a prayer of release for breath. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Make sure everybody's touched in Jesus' name. Yeah, how about it? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for breath. Thank you, Jesus, for Holy Spirit anointed breath infusing into our brothers and our sisters today in Jesus' name. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that they feel your presence right now, Lord God, as you clear their lungs, Father. You give them full capacity to breathe. We take authority over the spirit of asthma in the name of Jesus. We take authority over anything that has to do with blocking breath in Jesus' name. And we speak the nephesh life of God the breath that breathes into Adam's nostrils. We speak that same breath to come through your bodies in the name and the authority of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there. And make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand, and all their earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. They journeyed. 
And the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel, he and all the people that were with him. And he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared unto him when he fled from the face of his brother. And God appeared unto Jacob again when he came out of Padan Era and blessed him. And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. And the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, to thee I will give it, and to thy seed after thee will I give the land. And God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, even a pillar of stone. And he poured a drink offering thereon, and he poured oil thereon. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spake with him, Bethel. And they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath, to Rachel traveled, and she had hard labor. And it came to pass, when she was in hard labor, that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar upon her grave, that is the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day. Israel journeyed and spread his tent beyond the tower of Edar. And it came to pass, when Israel dwelt in that land, that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard it. Now the sons of Jacob were twelve, the sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon, and Levi, and Judah, and Issachar, and Zebulun. The sons of Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin. And the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's handmaid, Dan, 
and Naphtali. And the sons of Zilpah, Leah's handmaid, Gad and Asher. These are the sons of Jacob, which were born to him in Pate and Aram. And Jacob came unto Isaac his father unto memory, unto the city of Arba, which is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac sojourned. The days of Isaac were an hundred and fourscore years. And Isaac gave up the ghost and died, and was gathered unto his people, being old and full of days. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. A chapter loaded with sorrow. How much can a man take? One verse was not dramatized by the video, verse 8. It reads, Now Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried below Bethel under the turban tree. So the name of it is called Alan Bachoth. She possibly could have been his nanny when he was a little boy. Rebekah, his mother, is already dead. He's reconciled with his brother from whom he was estranged for over 20 years. And this follows chapter 34, the famous chapter full of the atrocities committed by his sons. The ruler's son had raped their sister and then wanted to marry her. And so in the peacemaking negotiations, they agreed in the village to, of Shechem to all be circumcised. The brothers thought up this plan. And on the third day when they were sore, weak, feverish, they went in and killed all the men. And then plundered the village and took the women, did far more than what the ruler's son had done. Angry people do crazy, over-the-top things, do they not? This week we were reminded through our media of an atrocity that happened 100 years ago in Tulsa where a black young man got on an elevator with a white woman and a rumor began of him assaulting her. Not proven, but in two days, 39 city blocks were destroyed, including 27 churches. 36 deaths, although it was many more than that, were documented. The strange thing, when you go into the archives of the local newspapers, the articles about those occurrences are missing. Fake news is not a new thing, folks. Sweeping things under the rug is not a new thing. Humankind has been doing it ever since the beginning of time. But what I love is the scriptures tell it all. It reveals our need for redemption. And it's paving the way for Jesus. The world needs Jesus today. The world is crying out for redemption, for reparations, for somebody to reconcile me. It can only come through the satisfaction of the wrath of God committed by Jesus upon the cross. The unjust death, the substitution, repairs everything. Trust in him, he can restore, because he has done the work. Can I get an amen? amen? So on the heels of that horrible experience, Jacob hears from God and goes back to Bethel where he had promised the Lord 20 plus years earlier, maybe 30 years earlier, that he would come back to that place if God would take care of him. So he finally makes good on his promise and gets to know the God of Bethel more. There's nothing like returning to the Lord when things go awry, right? Don't get mad at God and just leave him behind. We need him. Tell somebody, you need the Lord. 
That doesn't mean problems will end. Because then Deborah dies. Tragedy, sadness, sorrow. And on top of it all, they finally make it to his dad, and then he dies. But on the way, Rachel, his favorite wife, dies and leaves him a baby behind. They bury her on the side of the road on the way. And besides that, his firstborn son, the son that should have the birthright, has sex with one of his father's wives. How much can a man take? And it's about to get worse. We won't get into it, but the whole Joseph thing is going to happen. You reckon his boys need a savior? (laughs) I'd like to speak to you today on the subject, the real need for real comfort. You ever need comfort? I'm not talking about a comfortable life. I'm talking about comfort when nothing is comfortable. Psalm 23 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Psalm 71 says, You shall increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. Psalm 94 verse 19 says, In the multitude of my anxieties within me, your comforts delight my soul. Isaiah 12, 2 says, I will praise you, though you are angry with me, your anger is turned away, and you comfort me. Isaiah 40 says, comfort ye, comfort my people. Speak comfort to Jerusalem. Isaiah 49 says, sing, O heavens, be joyful, O Lord, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have mercy on his afflicted. Isaiah 51 says, For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. Verse 12, I, even I, am he who comforts you. Who are you that you should be afraid of a man who will die? I'm the one who comforts you. Why are you afraid of mortal man? Isaiah 52, Break forth into joy. Sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. Isaiah 57, verse 18. I have seen his ways and will heal him. It's talking about backsliders. I will also lead him and restore comforts to him. That passage is especially memorable to me. It was our 25th anniversary. We hadn't been in this building long. And so in celebration of our anniversary, my wife and I went to Hot Springs, Arkansas. You ever been there? Nice place. Lots of things for men to do and women to do. And it's, the city is a national park, believe it or not. So all national parks don't involve camping, I guess. And we visited a vineyard church, and in the middle of the service, the Lord brought to my mind our address, 5718 East Highway 377. And I thought, where is that in the Bible? It can only be two places, Psalms or Isaiah. And Psalm 57, I don't think has 18 verses, but Isaiah 57, 18, I hit gold. It's talking about backsliders. Here's the promise. I will restore comforts to him. I have seen his ways and will heal him. I will also lead him and restore comforts to him. So if you are a backslider, if you are away from the Lord, you are at a place with an address that points to God's desire to restore you. Amen. So I got excited when I came home. My first sermon was entitled 5718. The famous passage, the calling of Jesus, Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, verse 2, 
to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And I love this, Isaiah 66, 13. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you, and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. You know, God is not a man that he should lie. Uh, Men and women are made in his image. So he is all that we are that is righteous. And in describing his love for us, he says, can a mother forget her nursing child? This is also in Isaiah. I will never forget you. See, I have inscribed you in the palms of my hands. What does that remind you? Tattoos. No, it reminds me of the cross. We're there. And he uses a mother's love to describe it. And here, he uses a mother's comfort. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. Isaiah 66, 13. Jesus began what has been labeled the Sermon on the Mount. I don't like to call it the Sermon on the Mount. I like to call it the words of Jesus. He said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So can we read the title together today, The Real Need for Real Comfort. Paul wrote, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Can we say all comfort? who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. So God is the God of all comfort who comforts us so that we can comfort one another. Isn't that good? The real need for real comfort begins with knowing who God is. Know who God is. And he is the God of all comfort comfort. We just read it. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. The Christian life involves suffering. If someone talked you into following Jesus, telling you it's going to be easy street, they lied to you. Rain falls on the just and the unjust. The same flood that hits the sinner hits the righteous depending on the elevation of your house, right? But he's our God, and he will comfort us. He'll enable you. You may be the only one going through the current trial that you're going through, but trust me, others are going through trials. Others will experience sorrow. And you can be comforted by the Lord today, and tomorrow comfort them. Weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. Secondly, we can know that God wants to comfort us. He's the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our tribulation. Not some, all. Jesus said, these things I've spoken to you, that your joy may be full. In the world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So we have a comforter in Jesus who told us the truth so that we can have full joy. Not happiness that's related to happenstance, but joy that's related to the reality of the comforter who can remind us of the fact the story's not over. My problems are all temporary. I will see my loved ones again. I will overcome. All this is going to burn up, but I am not. Hallelujah. Thirdly, the real need for real comfort, we need to know, what we need to know is he wants us to comfort others. He wants us to be comforted by himself and through others. We'll see that again. But we need to know these things. He wants us to comfort each other. Sometimes there's a time for people to get over it. There are whiny babies in the world. But there are real problems, and people need real comfort 
May God help us not to be like the priest and the Levite that saw the man in the ditch and turned their eyes and went the other side. But we're to get down in the ditch with them and comfort them, help them. He finishes that passage we read. We're to receive comfort from the God of all comfort that we might be able to comfort those who are in any trouble, any trouble, all tribulation, any trouble, even the trouble that they've brought on themselves. You know, we could tell Jacob that. Oh, Jacob, you're reaping what you sowed, boy. How does it feel to be such a jerk now, huh? Where's Esau in all this? He's not. Jacob still needs comfort. The Redeemer's going to come through him. So all tribulation, those caused by others, those caused by life, those caused by the world, those caused by the devil, and those brought up on us by ourselves. 1 Thessalonians 4, talking about the end times, the return of the Lord, tells us that we're to comfort one another with these words. We're not to be setting dates based on what he wrote there. Who's the Antichrist? Not to be doing all that stuff. We're looking for the Christ, right? And this promise is one with which we are to comfort each other. The fifth chapter of 1 Thessalonians continues, Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. So he's telling them to do what they already know which is what preaching is. I'm just reminding you. If something's new, you better write it down because we can be forgetful. You know what the first commandment is? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy mind, all thy strength. That's the first great commandment. But what's the first little commandment? The word hear. Hear. O Israel, the Lord thy God is one, and you shall love him. So we're called to hear. And so when you need to be comforted and someone's trying to comfort you, listen, receive those words of life that are coming your way. When Joseph disappeared and Jacob believed it was a wild animal because his boys lied to him, he said, I don't want to be comforted. There's a time people don't want to be comforted. Now, obviously, how could his voice comfort him? <laughs> Criminals they were. <laughs> so there's a time to try to encourage someone. There's a time just to weep with them. They don't need our bumper sticker theology, you know. Christians aren't perfect. They just love the Lord. No, you just... Weep with those who weep, and then when the time comes, the door opens for comfort, then, then go for it. He concludes this chapter with these words. Now, we exhort you, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient. Some people are faint-hearted. Some people are crybabies. Are we supposed to diss them? No, just encourage them, comfort them. Eventually, they'll get sick and tired of being sick and tired, and they'll stand up. There's a season in all of our lives when we've been there. So it's time for mercy, folks. Need mercy. Let's just say things really go south in America. Are you going to get angry and blame folks that didn't vote for someone you thought they should have voted for? Or... We're all in it together, right? You Democrats, you Republicans. That won't do any good. Comfort the faint-hearted. Point them to Jesus, right? We don't rub people's faces in their mistakes. It doesn't work. It feels good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain... Yes, amen. Moving right on, Pastor. Know his word comforts his people. Do you, have you known the scriptures to be a comfort to you? This is my comfort, David said in Psalm 119. This is my comfort in my affliction, 
for your word has given me life. And all he had was Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, possibly the book of Job, Joshua, Ruth, and the word of God in those books give life, comfort. We are being comforted today by rebounding off of the story in Genesis. <laughs> this is Chris Marie. She's the newest addition to our family. Our son-in-law and his wife, our daughter, Paul and Summer Okimoto, are blessed to be able to have nannies help raise their kids. So through a nanny firm, they'll bring in an international student who for a year or two years help them with their kids. They work set hours. It's not slavery. The nannies get paid, and it's all that. So this is the newest nanny, Chris Marie. She is from South Africa. Yes. She posted this picture the other day with these words. We're talking about the Word of God. Chris Marie wrote, The single most powerful influence in my life has been the Word of God. Not growing up in a Christian home, not attending a nice church, not Christian friends, not Christian music. Nothing has impacted me as deeply, as powerfully, and as eternally as the Word of God. However, please understand that it has only impacted me to the degree that I have received it and allowed it to be implanted in me. James 1.21 says, quote, Receive with meekness the engrafted word which can save your souls, unquote. For years, I simply read the word and listened to it being preached. This had a positive impact on my mind, developing biblical values and Christian perspectives. But honestly, it made little difference in my heart and thus my relationship with Christ. It wasn't until I allowed the Holy Spirit to speak the Word of God into my heart and make His Word the center of my life that it truly transformed my life. And honestly, as long as I continue to receive God's Word from His mouth to my heart, it will not return void without accomplishing what He deserves and without succeeding in the matter for which He sent it. The one thing we desperately need every day is to grow in intimacy with our Father. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, Psalm 119, 105. The word is a lamp that only guides those who use it. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. The word is food that only nourishes those who eat it. Isn't that good? May the Lord help us to allow his word to comfort us. This is the blessing of hard times. We have to draw near to God or we'll be destroyed by our problems. There have been seasons in my life where I was totally miserable and a friend at work gave me a devotional. Some devotionals are nice, but some devotionals actually give life because they help drive the truth into your heart. And for years, this little book, My Utmost for His Highest, given to me by a student at Dallas Theological Seminary, changed my life. I had a job I hated for eight years, other things I didn't like. And this, just one page a day, bring life. Bring life. Paul also wrote in Romans 15, he says, whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. That's what we need is hope, right? Hope for a better day, hope for strength. Hope for the, when it won't hurt so much. 
hope for the reunion we'll have one day with those that have gone on before us when the circle will be unbroken. And that hope comes through the patience and comfort that the Scriptures can give us. He goes on to say, May the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another. May we be patient with one another and comforting to one another. According to Christ Jesus, was he patient? Was he comforting? That we may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? Amen. The real need for real comfort comes from knowing his Holy Spirit as our comforter. Jesus said in John 14, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He goes on, and then in verse 18, he concludes this part of the discourse. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So how will Jesus come to us in our need for comfort? Through the Holy Spirit, through the comforter. Anybody have comforters at the house? I have to have one when I go to bed. Not because they're that warm, but the weight of it just helps me rest. The Holy Spirit came to be our comforter, to give us rest, to give us strength. Through our trials, we can be encouraged. In chapter 16, he's still preaching. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I do not go away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So, a few days later, he sent the Holy Spirit. Well, over 50 days later. (laughs) And the Holy Spirit's been here ever since to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and to comfort the followers of Jesus. The real need for real comfort, we can know true prophecy gives us comfort. Now, I'm not talking about false prophecy that'll give us, give us false hope. That, that'll bankrupt your comfort. But true prophecy will give you comfort. He who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. Yesterday on our way home from Dallas, we stopped and uh, used the restroom and got something to drink right off of I-20. As we're sitting in our car preparing to leave, a vet sees a tall gentleman walk to his car out of the store and back his car up and then just sit there. And a vet turns to me and says, that man's a coach. I think I have a word for him. So we drove around. He just sitting there, not in his parking space, sitting there, not going anywhere. We pulled around and a vet rolled her window down Motion for him to roll his down. She says, are you a coach? He says, yes, I am. She says, well, the Lord wants to tell you that you're more than just a coach. You're a life coach. I don't know if you're a Christian or not, but the Lord wants to use you to bring life to people through your coaching skills. He says, I'm a pastor. He says, I'm a coach at Kansas City, in Kansas City at a community community college. (laughs) So that brought him an encouraging word of comfort. We don't know what he was doing in Dallas. You know, it could be something wonderful, could be something horrible. But no doubt, he was sitting there contemplating his, what he's going to go. And in his waiting, he got encouraged. Sometimes, saints, we get in too much of a hurry. You just need to wait on the Lord. He's the God of comfort and patience. Amen. Amen. If you ever needed the Lord before, you sure do need him now. The real need for real comfort involves knowing that God comforts us through others. We've already talked about comforting others, but now let's put ourselves in in the seat of receiving. God will comfort you, but many times it'll be through his people. Did you hear about the guy that showed up in heaven? said, why didn't you rescue me? I was in the flood, I was on the roof of my house, the the water was rising, and Peter said, man, the Lord sent you a helicopter, a boat, 
And even a life preserver came floating down. Yeah, but I wanted you to save me. I wanted the Lord to save me, not Peter. Boy, I sure messed that story up. (laughs) 2 Corinthians 7. Nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. So just Titus arriving, a friend. Nothing like a friend to bring comfort, right? The arrival of Titus comforted him, and he gave God the credit. Nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, he must have been downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was comforted by you, comforted in you. So Titus must have been downcast, who was comforted by the believers in Corinth, And Paul, who must have been downcast, was comforted by the arrival of Titus. And he was comforted by the comfort that Titus received from Corinth. You see the ripple effect? Just gift keeps on going, and God gets all the glory. He's the God of all comfort. If we're not involved in comforting others, we're missing out. The bridge you build, one day you may need. Therefore, verse 13, 2 Corinthians 7, we have been comforted in your comfort. When I see a brother or a sister being comforted, it comforts me. Yes, the body of Christ is alive and well. Amen. Sometimes people say the church needs to be doing more. The church, the church, the church. We are the church. Come alive, church. Get busy in the ministry of comfort. His comfort establishes us all. It establishes us as believers, as families, and as a congregation, and as the church in America and in the world, 2 Thessalonians 2. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. The real need for real comfort comes from a real God with real people and real words of life coming from him. But where is Jesus in all this? He's all about this. But since you asked, let's just conclude on this note. Hebrews chapter 4, talking about Jesus, our great high priest. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Come to him and you'll receive the comfort you have from him. Why? He's been there. He's been there. You ever had someone try to comfort you that hasn't, hasn't lost a parent or hasn't had a child ever rebel? Their kids are all perfect, blue ribbon citizens. You know, nobody in their family tree's ever been in jail. What can they say to comfort you that doesn't sound somewhat hollow, right? The Lord has been there. You've been betrayed, he's been there. You've been abandoned, he's been there. You've been broke, you've been there. You've been stripped naked and ashamed, been there. Been slandered, he's been there. Been tortured, robbed, falsely accused, and killed, he's been there. So we're able to go boldly to him. He knows what it's like. Son, daughter, I understand. Read this verse. Worship me. Sing this song. Go see this person. 
I'll tell you what comforts me is if someone has ever sinned against me, I run to the Father and say, Father, have I ever done this? And if I haven't, I thank him. But if I have, I thank him that he's forgiven me. And in that revelation, I forgive. You forgive. People sin. They have blind spots, right? The throne of grace is available. So today I'd like to conclude on a call to run to the throne of grace every time you need it. We can run to the throne today. We're going to have the sound man play us a pertinent song. If you'd like to receive the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is available to us today. This has been available for 20 plus centuries. Be filled with His power. Be refreshed, be renewed, be strengthened. So I just encourage you right now, in your seat, you can bow, you can kneel, or you can come forward, spend some time with the Lord, but I also like to ask people from the ministry team, the elders and wives, to come forward with the ministry team and be available to pray for people that need comfort or they'd like to receive the Holy Spirit. Can we do that?